Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to start reading this really awesome book. It's called History of the World in 1000 Objects. And this book was donated to me from my Amazon wish list, but the person who did didn't leave a note or anything, so I would shout you out, but I, d I don't know your name. So thank you to whoever sent it to me because this book is fantastic. Let's just dive right in. I'll show you what we're going to read tonight. We're going to start off, of course, at the very beginning, and I'm going to use this pointer pencil tonight. You'll see why. We'll start off with the early societies, 20,000 to 700 BCE. Tonight, we're just going to read Early Humans Shaping the World and The Enigma of the Indus Civilization. Let's get into it. All right, first, we're going to read this. Early Humans Shaping the World. Humanity's extraordinary success is due to our ingenuity in devising cultural means to overcome our physical limitations. Early stone tools seem crude, but they were the first step on the road to computers, the moon, and beyond. Along the way, we developed language, allowing the sharing of knowledge, skills, and ideas. Our early ancestors evolved first in Africa, Around 3.3 million years ago, they developed stone tools, perhaps to break open bones for marrow. This began a period called the Stone Age, divided into the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic. Around 1.7 million years ago, Paleolithic people spread into Asia and Europe, and later learned to hunt and control fire. Multiple species coexisted, including Homo sapiens, us modern humans, who appeared in Africa after circa 300,000 BCE, and interbred with other species, especially the Neanderthals, as they spread across Asia, Australia, and Europe after circa 100,000 BCE. Although like us, the Neanderthals buried their dead, cared for their old and sick, and created art, by 40,000 BCE, ours was the only species left and spread into the Americas by 12,000 BCE. The first farmers. By around 9600 BCE, the Ice Age had ended, and the world's climate was similar to today's. Newly available resources allowed communities in some areas to settle permanently instead of traveling to find food in different seasons. Some plant and animal species were exploited intensively to the point where they were controlled, cultivated, and domesticated by humans. As agriculture and a settled way of life caused population growth, Neolithic farmers expanded into new areas. Sedentary communities relied on expanded exchange networks to access resources from elsewhere. Exotic items, such as fine stone and metals, became highly sought after by emerging leaders to demonstrate their authority. So down here, we see a picture of Çatalhöyük in Turkey. It used to be a thriving little city in Anatolia. But it looks like now you can see some of like the brickwork, things like that. And up here we have a mysterious serpentine ball. We don't know why balls were carved from stone in northeast Scotland, but the skill required suggests they were highly valued. So let's take a look at some of the objects here. Starting off with technology and innovation. The earliest known tools were stone. Using their cutting edges, wood and other materials could also be made into tools. Over hundreds of thousands of years, tools became more specialized, designed for particular tasks, and the range of materials expanded to include clay, leather, fibers, shell, and later, metals. So the first tools, here we can see a hand axe. The first stone tools, 
made around 3.3 million years ago, had one simple cutting edge. Hand axes from around 1.65 million years ago were carefully shaped, digging, cutting, and general purpose tools. Down here, we can see the comfortable grip for holding in a hand. Here's the sharp edge for cutting. And here's the point for digging and boring holes. Here are some obsidian core and blades. Modern humans invented long, thin blades, which they used as cutting tools or reshaped for other purposes. Many small blades could be struck from a single core. So here you can see a blade core they used to make blades out of. Here's an unmodified blade, just singular. And here's another blade, but it's been snapped right there. Very pointy. So down here we have some hunting tools. This is a Clovis point, probably one of the most famous kinds of like points in the world. Elegant points were made by the North American Clovis culture as tips for spears, which were used as projectiles to hunt bison and mammoths. This example was found in a mammoth skeleton. Isn't that interesting? And here you can see a fluted base for attaching to a haft. So it was attached to a device to be thrown at a mammoth. Or at least hurt it enough so they could kill the mammoth, I suppose. Here is a barbed harpoon. Fishing, begun by early modern humans, became increasingly important after the last ice age. Fishing gear included wood, bone, and antler fish hooks and harpoons, nets, and elaborate fish traps. Here you can see the barbs on the harpoon. And even a big tip to spear the big fish. And here are some flint arrowheads. Bows and arrows to kill prey at a safe distance appear in the late Paleolithic. Later times saw many improvements in their efficiency, such as these arrowheads, with barbs to embed them more securely in prey. So here you can see this arrowhead, and it has these barbs. When they get stuck in the prey, it's harder to pull it out because you have these here. And here you can see this is a tank for attaching to an arrow shaft right here. Really interesting arrowheads. Check this out. This is an early saw, an Egyptian saw. Although some multi purpose tools continued to be made, over time, tools for specific purposes proliferated. This cast of an early Egyptian saw made around 3000 BCE is one such specialized tool. Look how pointy it is. And here is an edge chipped to form a series of teeth, it says. All the little teeth in the saw, just like the saws we use today. And here are some axes. So cool. This is a Neolithic diorite axe. Look at that. In the later Stone Age, after 10,000 BCE, people developed new techniques, grinding and polishing hard stone to make axes for felling trees and other purposes. You can see just how polished the surface is. And this is the cutting edge right here. It looks very much kind of like a modern axe blade in a way. And how like smooth it is. This is a stone shaft hole axe. Stone shaft hole axe. As metal objects spread in 3rd millennium BCE Europe, communities that did not use metal made from fine stone imitate did not use metal made fine stone imitations of them. What? The third millennium. Communities that did not use metal made 
fine stone imitations of them. I promise I can read. Not as tools, but as prestige fashion items. Wow. So here you can see the hole right here to stick to the haft. Little point right there. And this cool bad boy up here is a mesolithic stone tool, it says. Heavy stone tools served various purposes such as adzes to plane and trim wood, and picks perhaps to dig up plants or knock limpets off rocks. Take a look at this. Here's of course the big point for the axe. It is a horizontally mounted blade sticking out like this. So you can hold the handle here. Of course, that's a replica because the wood wouldn't survive. You can hold this and go chop, 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 woodpecker style, right? And here is a leather thong holding the stone to the wood handle. So cool. Up here are some tools for agriculture. Here we see an early sickle. As grains became important in the diet, sickles were developed to harvest them as well as to cut reeds used in matting, basketry, and construction. This sickle you can see here is the bone haft. And on the little inlet flint bladelets chop the grains. And up here it even has a decorative deer's head at the end. That's pretty cool. See the little face here. Little eye. Cute. This is a digging stick. Digging sticks were used to dig up tubers and to make holes to plant seeds and bulbs. A stone weight on the stick increased its power of penetration. So here we can see this stick is a modern replica. This is the ancient part that was found. So this big stick goes through this, the ancient perforated pebble weight, and there's a twig shoved in there with the stick to prevent movement so it doesn't wobble around, it stays firm. So it didn't have glue or any kind of sealing materials back then, so they would hold this part and shove it down to the ground, probably until it hit this so they would know how deep to go. Pretty. Culture. In many parts of the world, the late Paleolithic saw the flowering of art, including painting, engraving, and sculpture. Fired clay came into use at this time, providing a medium with huge scope for later artistic expression, as did textiles woven from plant fibers. Stone monuments, often with a ritual purpose, were created from at least 9500 BCE. And it, so Stonehenge is a good example of that, but we won't talk about Stonehenge tonight. Check this out. A mammoth spear thrower. This fine bone carving from France combined practical utility as a spear thrower with artistic sensitivity to the natural world. So this is a tool. That's where the spear would go. This is a hand grip. Lace your fingers through that. Pull it back. Toss it. But they decorated it. They carved a little friend into it. It goes right here into his tail. That's so neat. I like it a lot. Cute. And here it talks about cave art. Impressive Paleolithic cave paintings found in France and Spain include representations of animals like this horse and mammoth from Lascaux, France, as well as geometric shapes, dots, and handprints, both engraved and painted. Some of the older art may have been created by Neanderthals. The art's purpose is unknown, but may have featured an in initiation, religious, or magical rites. Let's look at some everyday home life tools. Mobile people including most hunter-gatherers, generally had few possessions. Sedentary and agricultural communities, however, 
often relied on a range of different technologies such as fragile pottery and heavy kerns or grindstones. After 11,500 BCE, as more settled communities developed across much of the world, objects proliferated. <laughs> Rooster just started growing, so it, there he goes. Okay, anyway. Weaving on simple looms began in Neolithic times using cotton in India and South America, and flax and other plant fibers in Western Asia and Europe. More complex looms and silk and alpaca and sheep's wool came into use later. Here's a weaving comb and combing out the fibers and a clay loom weight. I don't know much about weaving on looms to know what the weight is for, but it's pretty neat. They made a little clay weight. Look at this. Bone cutlery from Chatal Huyuk. The shift to sedentary life and agriculture in many regions brought dietary changes and the associated development of new cooking and eating utensils. Here's the spatula. So they can make pancakes, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> they make cake. A big old spoon. Because you gotta have your spoons. And even a fork. And they decorated the handle. They made it fancy. Here are some grinding tools. Cereal grains, also seeds and nuts, were ground into flour to cook as bread, porridge, or gruel. Grinding with a kern and rubber became an arduous daily task for many women. So here you can see, <laughs> sorry about the roosters, will stop in a second. The kern right here, a nice big flat stone to put all your kernels on. Then you take this sandstone rubber and roll it over Roll it like a rolling pin until it's nice and ground to make into flour. Kind of a monotonous task, but an important one. Let's look at some pottery. This is a later Jomon pot from Japan. Isn't that gorgeous? Pottery was independently invented many times in different parts of the world. The earliest pots, including Jomon wares, come from late Paleolithic East Asia. Look at the scalloped rim here. They just went so, so detailed in their pottery. Look at all this applied decoration. So they would like take the clay, get it wet, roll it up like Play-Doh, you know, and then push it on there before they fire it in a kiln. So it has all of these little curlies on it. That's beautiful. Even like by today's standards. Just imagine this was made before like writing was invented. It's so beautiful even today. This is a bell beaker culture pot. Just kind of a mouthful, but it describes it here. The bell beaker culture made a distinctive style of pottery pottery beaker with an upside down bell shape in parts of Europe after 2900 BCE. So clearly for this culture the main artifact left behind were their pots and since it's a, a bell shaped beaker pot they're the bell beaker culture. So let's see what they've done to these pots. Incised designs and impressions made by cord. So instead of rolling it up like play-doh they would take like a a stick, right? And carve it in. So pretty. And this is a zoned decoration. That's in two. You have a pattern on this end. A pattern on this end. Oh, and the cord, they would wind it around here to make the, the little stripes, I guess. Indentations there. And it's a bell-like beaker shape. Hence the bell beaker culture. Look at this pot. Isn't this creative? A wagon-shaped pot. Invented in the 4th millennium BCE, wheeled transportation using draft animals revolutionized work by making it easier to transport heavy or bulky goods. This pot was found in Eastern Europe. I bet whoever made this felt very clever. 
they've got an incised decoration, so they took a stick, drew it in there while the clay was still wet before they dried it or fired it. There's a wheels there and even a little axle so that it can actually roll around. A little handle here too. Very clever pot. Let's check out some artifacts based on beliefs and rituals the religious beliefs of people who lived before writing was in before writing was invented are unknown to us past peoples as richly varied ways of treating their dead artistic representations and places with offerings and sometimes sacrifices provide some clues we can also learn much by studying the religious practices of existing cultures and comparing them with traces left by prehistoric peoples. So these are some rich grave goods. As communities expanded, social differences developed within them. The treatment of the dead often reflected their status in life with rich grave goods denoting important people. So it looks like they've got some little gold hawks in here. Beaten sheet gold over the, the hot furnace and they've put little decorations in it so while it's still you know I guess wobbly how metal would be they would take a I guess maybe like a stick or something or an axe and make little dots around it make it fancy and the holes here are to attach it to clothing so it's decorative pretty neat this out. Burial art. Some European late Neolithic megalithic tombs included stones bearing geometric designs. These designs may have held some religious significance. They sometimes also appear on the associated grave goods, such as plaques made from a hard stone called schist, found in southern Spain and Portugal. So here's a schist plaque little intricate triangles all over it and a stone box cover and it says the burial designs visible only to the dead person inside the tomb that's pretty neat here is a jericho plastered head in parts of early neolithic west asia some individuals were buried beneath house floors some skulls were removed and modeled with lifelike features, perhaps for use in ancestor rituals. So they took the skull, you can see right here, the skull where the plaster fell off, and they covered it in plaster. They put cowrie shells in the eyes, and they modeled the face, you know, make a nose, make ears, so it still looks like the living person kind of eerie, but that's what they did. And this is a Chintoro mummy. Some cultures preserved their dead by mummification. The earliest were the South American Chinchoro from 5000 BCE. They removed the flesh, reassembled the bones, and replaced the skin. So here you can see the reassembled body. Looks like they packed it with plants, probably like putting where the organs would be, and they made this really creepy looking clay mask to put over the head. It looks like something out of Pan's Labyrinth, right? It's kind of eerie looking, but in like a cool way, right? Let's check out some human figurines. A late Neolithic figures right here. Stone figurines were made by cultures across the world. Some were for use in rituals, while others were decorative, made social statements, or were toys. So this little figure here, it's got a little face, <laughs> like a very stereotypical little face. He's got schematic arms here, and a slot for mounting it, so it can stick on top of maybe a pot or something, or like a something to hold up a toy, I don't know. Venus figurines, very famous 
human figurines from this time period. These female figurines from late Paleolithic Europe are known as Venus figurines. Made from mammoth ivory, stone, and baked clay, they have strongly emphasized hips and breasts and are generally faceless. Their purpose remains unclear. So this Venus is made out of fired clay, which probably means it was modeled by hand very carefully. And this big one here is made out of mammoth ivory. So you can see there's her head. Of course, no facial features or anything. Here are her arms resting on top of her hips, it looks like, or her stomach. This part's been damaged, so it's probably her big, her big tummy. She's got very pronounced buttocks. She's very voluminous in the bottom, and she has very small, tapering legs down here. And this is probably the most famous Venus. She's made out of limestone. This is the Venus of Willendorf. And what's interesting about here, you can also see her little arms resting right here, resting on top of her breast there, is her head has this kind of cord around her. So it's debated whether or not that's meant to be hair or a, like a wool hat of some kind. It's very debatable in archaeological history, but we'll probably never know. But by far the most famous Venus. And I think this is a little bigger than she is life size. She's probably about my next topic about the Indus civilization. The enigma of the Indus civilization. Around 2500 BCE, the world's first planned towns and cities appeared throughout the Indus region, which are part of present-day India and Pakistan. Indus society was highly organized and produced many fine artifacts. Yet there is no conclusive evidence for kings, organized religion, or warfare. Most Indus towns and cities had a massive raised sector, the citadel, with monumental public buildings. These included the Great Bath at Mahenjadaro, which was perhaps a place of ritual purification. Indus political organization remains a mystery partly because the writing invented by the Indus people defies deciphering. However, society was organized and controlled, with a good standard of living and highly developed craft specialization. A warehouse and workshops at Lothal in southern Gujarat, as well as Harappa in the Punjab, exemplify the role of towns and cities in manufacturing, storing, and distributing goods for external trade and circulation within the Indus realm. Rivers provided transportation networks, and goods were carried by herders moving between seasonal pastures. Traders brought in ivory and other materials from beyond the settled lands. Gulf Traders The valleys, mountains, and coasts of the Indus state provided agricultural and pastoral abundance, and many raw materials. The Indus people also obtained metal ores and lapis lazuli from Afghanistan. They shipped lapis lazuli to Mesopotamia, along with carnelian and other gemstones, ivory, timber, gold, copper, and other materials, probably in exchange for silver and woolen textiles. After 1800 BCE, unknown changes brought about the disintegration of the Indus realm. Towns and cities were abandoned, and writing ceased. However, farming communities continued to flourish in many parts of the region. Down here you can see Mahendradaro, massive archaeological site, and full of wondrous mystery. Let's read about it. Public building. Mahendradaro, in present-day South Pakistan, was the largest Indus city, covering more than 620 acres and with a population of perhaps 100,000 people. 
Many of its structures, which included more than 700 wells, were built of baked bricks in standardized size. That's so interesting, isn't it, that they had a size that every single brick had to be. You can see kind of here, all the different bricks there. So look at this. This is really interesting in a disc culture. This animal appears a lot in a lot of their seals and and their um, language too, I think. Their alphabet was more like pictures. So naturalistic motifs. So this one's interesting. There is a very tiny moth that's been flying around. I'm sorry if you could have seen it, but it just landed on my windscreen. Get off. Oh dear. Okay, come on, buddy. There you go. Okay. I had to knock it off with a pencil. <laughs> I don't want it in my face. I don't want to swallow it. <laughs> Natural motifs. So yeah, what's interesting is that this bull shape appears a lot. This animals with one horn often appear on Indus seals. This may be a unicorn, or possibly a bull viewed in profile. It's probably a bull viewed in profile, but wouldn't it be cool if they were unicorns? Can you imagine if they actually, actually had unicorns? <laughs> Can you imagine? Let's look at some items of beliefs and rituals. Unlike other ancient civilizations, the Indus people did not build temples, and there are few clues to their religious beliefs. Images on seals show powerful animals such as bulls and tigers alongside human figures, perhaps gods. There are also pottery figurines interpreted as votive offerings. In the 1930s, the British archaeologists who excavated Hindu cities identified some of these images with later Hindu gods. So look at this female figurine here. This terracotta figurine of a woman with a large headdress may have been a votive offering or a toy. You can see the big pannier headdress here. She's got a neck choker, a pendant necklace, and a beaded belt. She's very decorated. So here's some famous seals here. Here's a sacred tree. You can see the purple leaves there. This Indus seal from Mahendradaro shows two animal heads beneath a pipal tree, which later became sacred to Hindus. Here's a proto Shiva right here. This figure, wearing a horned headdress and surrounded by wild animals, may be a god. Archaeologists saw this as an early form of Shiva horns here, and the little animals around it. You can see some of their writing up here too, that hasn't been deciphered. The mythological scene. Some induce seals, such as the one shown here, show humans grappling with tigers. They may be gods or mythological heroes. He's got two tigers, one in each hand, holding him by the neck. Can you imagine if this was like someone's family crest in a way. It's, I'm the, the two tigers man. Family. That's pretty cool. Let's look at some adornment from the Indus Valley. The Indus people set great store by personal adornment. Wearing necklaces, pendants, hair and ear ornaments, rings, anklets, and bead belts made from materials such as metal, ivory, balance, which is glazed ceramic, terracotta, shell, and stone. Bangles were particularly important. Indus bead makers were extremely skilled in working gemstones, such as agate, carnelian, serpentine, and steatite. Never heard of that one. So here we can see a gold bangle. Indus women generally wore bangles. Their materials give clues to social status, pottery or shell for the majority, silver or gold for the elite. So we can see here that this was a gold rod that was bent to make the bangle. Here's an ear ornament. This ornament has lost its inlay, perhaps of carnelian. The edge decoration is of gold wire 
soldered onto the domed disc. Isn't that interesting? That's where the little gemstone would be. And here's a neck ornament. This, the design of this gold neck choker, which has been broken in two, reveals a high level of skill on the part of the goldsmith who made it. You can see here the part of the clasp. Do you think that the other half was a lobster claw? one of the, the classic ASMR words if you don't know lobster claw clasp but you can see it's a little half moon shape here I go behind your neck so you can see this part along your neck and it even has spacer beads in between very fancy joker let's look at some statues of art and culture the uniformity of Indus culture suggests it was part of a well-organized controlled society. Skilled artisans manufactured high-quality goods from materials such as fine flint quarried in Sindh, gemstones mined in Gujarat, and seashells. Indus art included a few bronze and stone sculptures, miniature images of animals carved on seals, which you can see up here, and vibrant terracotta figurines. Here we can see a terracotta bull, isn't it cute? Indus figurines portrayed domestic and wild creatures, including pet dogs, rhinos, birds, and squirrels. The bulls were the most popular subject. Here's a naked lady, but I, I wouldn't call that a, a lady. I wouldn't see that and automatically think, yeah, that's a lady, but let's see what it says here. Female figurines usually wear nothing apart from jewelry. Only rarely are they portrayed clothes and undertaking domestic tasks. Here you can see the little blob eyes there. So whoever made this pushed in the eyes like this, took little round pieces of clay, and patted them in to make eyes, and then pinched the nose. They went around the clay. Oh, you can see like that to make the nose. A little line there. And they made a little joker on her hip. Very genuitive. And here is Priest King, by far like the most famous little artifact to come out of Manjadar, I believe. This tiny stone sculpture, only seven inches high, is often said to represent an Indus ruler, but there is no evidence to support this. And we don't know if he was a priest or a king or both or neither. Lastly, we're going to look at some technology and innovation. Indus towns and cities were all set out in a well-defined grid pattern, and the residents enjoyed a highly sophisticated water supply and drainage system. Specialized Indus craft products included fine flint and copper tools, and a wide range of pottery, fine cotton textiles, dyed various colors, including yellow, blue, and red, were made at home. Let's look at these cubic stone weights first. Indus officials used standardized weights, ranging from a base unit of 0 0.03 ounces up to 23.9 pounds, or 12,800 units. The levels of standardization in a society is very and lastly, let's look at this block cart. This model shows a cart pulled by two blocks. Carts just like this are still used in the Indus Valley today. So the yoke here is a replica because it's made out of wood. But there's two little bulls here. You can see their little horns, just like this guy up here. And here's the cart, a solid disc wheel. And look, this person is just like this person with the blob eyes and the pinched nose. Very interesting. So that's going to be it for tonight. Isn't this book wonderful? I stopped here because it goes on and on about Mesopotamia and Babylonian artifacts next.
and then Egyptian as well. So many different, really cool artifacts and jewelry and figurines, statues, amulets, mummies, Stella. So many cool things, right? So there's a lot to there we go to check out in this book. I can't wait to do it with you guys. So thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, good, good.